Thanks very much. So really happy that you're actually here on a Friday uh, afternoon. So thank you so much for coming. Um, there's a great keynote as well with the quantum talk coming up after that. So I really hope you'll stay for that. But we're going to start off having a look at how we can use graph theory and network science to explore a microservice architecture. So as always, please do ask questions uh, through the app and rate the session. Uh, and any feedback as well, that would be great. So I'm going to start off, just give you a little bit of a, a sort of background on myself and where I come from, because that feeds into the story that I'm going to tell you. So my name is Nikki Watt. I'm the CTO at a company called Open Credo. We're based out of London. And we're a hands-on software development consultancy that helps organizations to adapt and adopt emerging technology to solve their business problems. We focus on two main areas. The one is sort of cloud native and microservice development, and the other one is data engineering. So in the data engineering space, we've helped uh, quite a few companies with connected data type problems. So these are problems, for example, where you might have a social network or a political science network, and you want to understand how the people are connected to each other and paths through those people, or infrastructure networks, how the infrastructure networks themselves are laid out physically, and even things like an ethical supply chain management. So if you have a a sort of series of goods and they're made up of different components. How do you know where the components have come from? Have they been ethically supplied? And uh, this is all done in a graph and we're specialists in a technology called Neo4j. And this talk is going to look at trying to combine both of those areas and say, can we take some of the sort of theory and the approaches that we use in the business domain that we, we use and see if we can apply that to a microservice architecture and see if we can find some interesting insights from that. So, whoops. Oh dear, a little fast. So, the first 15 minutes or so, uh, we're gonna spend just doing uh, an introduction and covering, covering a little bit of theory. Um, so we're gonna uh, just cover things like, why am I doing this talk? Why am I trying to bring these two things together? And then a little bit of graph theory. Um, I can guarantee there's not going to be some, any heavy-duty math, so you don't need to worry about that. But we do need to set uh, a little bit of the foundation so that we can then take that and then practically try and apply that onto a microservice architecture to see what insights we can see. So, oh, to begin with, what I'd like to say is that uh, there are already places within the general sort of software, building software systems where graphs are, graphs are already used. So they're already driving efficiencies in uh, software systems. And an example of this is um, in the code space. So you may already be, if you're in the Java space, you might be using something like Maven, where you've got your package, your dependencies uh, of all of the, the dependencies that you use in your code. You might use something like IntelliJ. Uh, where you might be able to have a look at things like circular dependencies and how things are, are laid out from that perspective. Or maybe you've even got uh, something in your CI CD pipeline where you need to analyze the vulnerabilities in your software, or maybe even the open source violations that you might have. So if you're building an open source uh, product and you want to make sure that all the libraries within the libraries within the libraries have got the right licensing, you might use something like SNCC. Likewise, it's also used in the infrastructure space. So, sorry, this is going in the wrong direction. Oh, dear. There we go. Sorry, very sensitive. Um, so Terraform is a really good example of um, a, a technology that uses graph, uh, a graph and graph theory under the covers. So for those of you who maybe don't know what Terraform is, it's an infrastructure as code uh, piece of technology uh, written by the guys from HashiCorp. And it essentially allows you to define um, a sort of network of components that you want created in a cloud like Amazon or Google. So you would define things like, I want two machines, I want a network, and then I want to put these together. And then Terraform would take that and it would apply it in the cloud for you. Now, under the covers, what it's doing is it's creating something called a directed acyclic graph, uh, and it's working out how can I, for example, parallelize those options in order to make sure I can create the uh, infrastructure in as fast a uh, sort of time as possible, but also make sure that it gets created in the right order. Oh, sorry, this is going so fast. Um, so the other area is in the ops and monitoring. 
Now, hopefully, if you're uh, already doing microservices, um, hopefully you're already looking at something like distributed tracing in order to get insight into the sort of latency analysis and the, the paths that your microservices can take through, through the system. And under the covers, uh, so this is things like the open tracing API, so Zipkin and Jaeger are examples of this. And under the covers, they're also using for the traces and the spans um, a graph in order to map out what the calling path is and allow you to, to visualize that and actually see how are the, how are the services calling each other. Oh, it's going to be one of those. Sorry. Let me move. Go a little further. Let's just do it manually. All right. So, um, given that we can, given that we can use, uh, we, we're already having a look at how different parts of software can actually use graphs under the cover. What I would like to have a look at is, can we also use the, the, the same sort of thing to have a look at whether we can create improvements in our microservice architecture? And the hypothesis that uh, I want to put forward is that I think it should be possible for us to move towards, trying to move towards what I call a data-driven architectural improvement. So we've already seen that you can extract metrics and KPIs from your microservice architecture through things like distributed tracing systems and the like. But I think you can also use uh, some of the techniques from, from graph theory and then apply those on a microservice architecture and actually get some insights into the characteristics of the architecture itself. So this talk can go in a couple of different directions. So in order to make it concrete, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take one uh, particular microservice architecture, and we're going to see if we look at some of these metrics and we analyze it, can we detect a bad architectural smell? So something like a, a bad architectural smell would be uh, a tightly coupled um, architecture, like a distributed monolith. So uh, Sam spoke about this yesterday, uh, and as a, a sort of a side note, uh, what can often happen is that uh, when uh, you, we sometimes find when we go to clients, uh, we often will go in right from the beginning, uh, and we can help steer them in the right direction when they're building a microservice architecture. But sometimes things have gone a little bit wrong, and then we also get called in. And uh, one of the most common culprits is a tightly coupled architecture. So we're going to see, can we detect this with uh, the, um, some of the properties that we're going to have a look at. Now, this does require a little bit of theory, so we're going to just go through uh, a few things. So first up, what is a graph? What is graph theory? So really, a graph is just a way to formally represent a network or a collection of objects in a mathematical way. So there are the entities, which are called nodes or vertices, and then there are the relationships called the uh, sort of, ed or relationships which are also called edges. Now the examples I've given to you before of a social network or an infrastructure network, you could understand the different entities that would be involved here. For our intents and purposes, this is going to be a microservice architecture, which itself is also just a network. So the nodes in this case will be the microservices themselves, and the relationships will be the calling path that they make between each other. So when microservice A calls B, which calls C, which calls D, those are the relationships that we want to represent and analyze. Uh, in this particular case, we're also going to only look at HTTP calls. So how do you then go about, once you've, you know, once you've got a uh, sort of graph, how do you actually get insights out of that? So there are these things called uh, graph analytics, and there are graph algorithms. So in graph analytics, this is really just an action that you perform on the, the graph in order to have a look at how the data is connected. Once you've actually got the data, uh, just visualizing it is actually a really powerful technique to get your first type of insight. So humans are actually really good at detecting patterns themselves. So if you can actually just visualize a, a graph, you've got at least a starting point for doing some analytics, even if it is manual. But more powerful are maybe some of the graph algorithms that you can run across the network in order to give you further kind of insights using the mathematical properties of a graph to be able to explore and classify things and interpret what is going on. So 
I just wanted to give a little bit of difference uh, between graph theory and network science. Um, we're going to concentrate more on the graph theory side, although the talk is exactly the same. Um, but graph theory really dates all the way back to the 1700s. So it was a mathematician by the name of Leonard Euler, and he was trying to solve the Cronenberg's bridge problem. And this is where uh, graph theory actually started. And graph theory really looks at the sort of abstract theoretical constructs of a graph and has a look at the properties and the sort of um, characteristics of that. So if, for example, it's a tree or it's a random graph, you can say, oh, well, I understand this is how I would traverse it, and these are the types of um, properties I could get out of it. It doesn't really care about the domain. It's just graphs of any size. On the network science side, this is something that's only recently come about in this century, um, and it's a new sort of uh, academic field, and it looks at very particular domains and massive graphs. So you're starting to look at things like biological networks, DNA networks, and even massive social networks. So for example, Facebook is an example of, of this, where they've got billions of nodes in, uh, in their graph to represent people. And it's only really with the advent of more modern cloud computing that we're able to start analyzing all of these massive graphs. So, our microservices are hopefully not going to be in the billions of nodes, and if they are, you've got a real problem. Um, so we're going to stick a little bit more on the, the sort of theory side of things, but there is overlap and it's nuanced, some of the differences, but I thought it's probably just worth highlighting what those are. So just to sort of a, a, a sort of overview, so in order to get graph insights, Graph theory is based on, on maths, and the algorithms themselves just use the relationships between the nodes to infer the organization and the dynamics of the complex systems. And then a network science will take, will take the graph, they'll take the algorithms, and they'll use that to uncover hidden information and make predictions and test hypotheses. And that's what we're going to be doing moving forward. So, I'm going to take you through uh, three sort of areas that we're going to look at. But before we do that, it's worthwhile saying that in general, um, graph algorithms are classified under three main sort of headings. There's pathfinding algorithms, centrality algor algorithms, and then community detection. So the pathfinding we're not really going to cover today, um, but it's, these are algorithms where you would do things like find the shortest path through a particular network. So if it was a transportation network, you might say, I'm in Berlin, I would like to get to London. What are all of the cities, the shortest path I can, I can use to navigate through that? Centrality and community detection is more where we're going to play. Um, centrality is where you want to have a look at, at how important a particular node is in a network. So how significant is it? Is it does it have a lot of um, sort of network or traffic coming through it and or going out, or can it facilitate that in a network? And community detection is really around um, trying to identify groupings or clusters of, of nodes within the network. So the first of the three um, metrics and algorithms we're going to have a look at is something called the degree of a node. And the degree of a node is really simply how connected is that specific node within the network. So if we have a look at this example, we can see that A is more highly connected than B and C. And that's because A has got uh, six uh, connections either coming into or going out of it, whilst B and C have only got two. And if we think about this from a microservice perspective, what this would mean is that a microservice is making potentially six outbound calls or it's, and or having calls made into it. So it's potentially an indicator of how, how busy that particular individual service is. The next metric uh, that I'd like to have a look at is something called the cluster coefficient. So this um, tries to have a look at how tightly grouped a particular cluster of uh, nodes are compared to how tightly clustered they could be. So that sounds a little bit abstract, so let me try and give you an example to explain this a little better. So if we take this as a, a social network, this is a group of friends, and we have this blue person uh, on the right here, we know that the blue person knows three people. And what we want to ask here is how well do all four of those people know each other? So the cluster coefficient will calculate relative to the blue person. It will have a look and say, okay, well, those uh, friends, they mostly know each other. 
but actually the top person doesn't know the bottom person. So when it calculates the cluster coefficient, it comes out at 0.66, or there's about a 66% probability that all of those friends know each other. If you compare that to uh, the group on the left, you can see that that blue person also knows three people, but all three of those people all know each other as well. So the cluster coefficient comes out at 100%, or amongst those four people, it's a completely tight-knit group of friends and they all know each other. Now, the application for us in a microservice uh, architecture is that we can potentially use this to detect when there's a lot of chatting going on amongst a particular group of microservices. And this might indicate we've got quite a chatty architecture or potentially some coupling we need to look at. So the final, uh, um, the final sort of group of, well, the, the final set we're gonna have a look at is something called community detection. And this is where uh, you use, there's a, a range of algorithms that you can use to find related groupings of uh, nodes within a network and uncover those and, the, and sort of quantify how, how, how good they are or not. So the way this typically works is that you would run one of these algorithms across the network uh, and it would go through and it would have a look at, at groupings and it would say, well, actually, I think that purple lot over there are more tightly coupled together. The blue ones seem to be related and the, the orange ones seem to, to be related differently. And then you as a human would get the results and you, could, you would then make a decision as to what you thought those groupings were. So you might say, okay, well, maybe the purple lot, maybe that's sort of a bounded context. Maybe it looks like all of my, you know, uh, I don't know, payment stuff. The orange ones, that seems to be all the Salesforce people, and the blue ones represent something else. But it gives you an indication of some of the groupings and allows you as a human to make some decisions uh, around that. So those are our basic uh, metrics and algorithms that we're going to use. Are we going to apply that onto an, uh, a microservice architecture? Are we going to have a look, can we actually see any kind of insight just using these uh, metrics for the moment? So the microservice architecture we're gonna have a look at, uh, version one of the architecture. It's a very simple microservice architecture. There's only 23 microservices in here. It's based on a commerce and retail domain. And as I said before, all of the microservices are talking through uh, REST and HTTP amongst one another. So this is the glorious architecture. Obviously, you can't work out what's going on here and you're not meant to, uh, just for the moment. But one of the key things that we need to do in order to do this analysis is somehow we need to get all of the services and all of their connections into a, uh, a database or something that we can analyze. So this particular example is using Neo4j under the covers, but in other places it's also using just Python in memory. So you might say, well, okay, but how do we do that? How do we actually get the microservices and their connections into something that we can analyze? So in this particular case, it was done statically. So I uh, happen to know what the things are. So you can say, all right, uh, let's, let's create the, the entries in the database and, and sort of wire them up. And that's fine, but it's not the greatest because I could get it wrong. I might think that something is still calling another entity when in fact it actually isn't. So the far better way to do this is to use some kind of dynamic tooling in order to do it. So as I said before, hopefully you will, um, if you're in the microservice space, you'll be using some distributed um, sort of tracing tools, something like Zipkin. But what you can do with this is you can get the, uh, the sort of traces and you can parse out uh, who's calling who. And then if you kind of stream that in, you can in real time build up this graph as the, as, as the services start calling each other. If you happen to be using maybe something like a service mesh, so something like Istio or the like, you could hook into the mixer and you could also watch uh, what's calling what and use that information in order to extract the, the entities and build out, this, uh, build out this system. So we've, got, we've managed to get the stuff, we don't really know what's going on yet, and we run our network stats and we get something that looks like this. So this is showing us the degree and the cluster coefficient. The degree is split out by whether it's inbound or outbound. Um, but that's not really helpful. We can't get too much uh, sort of information out of this. So if we at least flip that into a chart, 
that helps us to get a little bit more insight into things. So we can see that for most of the, for most of the services, as far as the degree is concerned, it's only got one degree, so it doesn't really matter. But actually for the top six uh, sort of uh, uh, microservices, they've got a degree of six or more, which means that for that particular service, they're either making six outbound calls and or receiving it. So they are potentially an indicator that they might be doing a lot of work and we might want to have a look at that. But let's see what the cluster coefficient says. So we do the same thing for that, and we find out, all right, likewise, we've got um, a whole bunch of services that don't even register. Their cluster coefficient is zero. But our top seven uh, sort of uh, offenders, uh, as far as the cluster coefficient is concerned, has got a value of 0 0.6 and above. So this means that those services uh, have got a sort of 60% 60, 60 probability that they're also all talking amongst each other and they might be quite chatty. And again, it's an indicator that maybe we should be looking a little bit closer at, at those services. So we've been directed, we've got some information, we've got uh, some metrics. But now we want to understand, OK, how does this actually fit in? Which part of the architecture is it pointing at? And is it actually problematic? So this is where um, you do need to obtain some kind of architecture knowledge to try and apply the metrics that you found onto your, your actual, your real world scenario. So we have our architect. They've given us a diagram uh, which shows us roughly how the services are working. You don't need to understand too much of the details, but in general, we've got at the top, we've got the dark blue services, which are our front-end services, which are receiving our client requests. It's the web API, the mobile API. The light blue services are our back-end services doing most of the work. There's some databases there. Each microservice has its own one, as all good microservices should. And then we've got the, uh, the purple ones, which we've got some of them in the sort of top, uh, top left are doing, uh, it's an adapter which allows you to speak to shipping APIs, so things like DHL and the like. And the bottom ones are payment adapters or payment gateways speaking to the different payment services. Now, we may have already noticed, an architect probably pointed out, that actually there's this big ball of mud that seems to be happening over here. Everything seems to be calling everything. And it's probably problematic, but you know we're, we're not sure. So what would be interesting now is to see do the metrics that we ran, do they somehow also indicate what intuitively our architect thought and, and what looks like potentially a problem on this system? So if we, if we highlight uh, the degrees first, we can see that uh, the six uh, or the seven, six, six, uh, the six um, microservices that were highlighted, most of them are in the big ball of mud. Um, which we could say, okay, well, we could visually see that. So that's, that's at least indicative that the big ball of mud is potentially problematic. What about, um, what about the cluster coefficients? And similarly, the ones that it's identified are also the services in the big ball of mud. So interestingly, the top, the top services have also been uh, sort of brought in there. And if you think about this, you might expect that at least when a call comes into uh, a top-end uh, sort of front-end microservice, that it is going to have to potentially make uh, multiple calls in order to do things. But what you might not want is that the, uh, the, the calls themselves are then doing loads of calls amongst one, one another. And that's essentially what's happening here. So, what can be quite tempting to do is to, is to just run the averages. So you can say, well, you know, what if I just get the average cluster coefficient and the degree? Is that going to give me any kind of information? And generally, I'd say that in this, in this scenario, it actually doesn't really help. So you get something like a, you get an average degree of 3.6 and 0 0.3. And all it really does if you were to take those numbers is hide some of the problematic areas. So when it comes to doing this type of analysis, it's actually more important to look at the sort of top offenders and maybe even the ones at the bottom in order to get some interesting information. Now, if you actually look a little bit closer at this particular architecture, when you have a look at what's gone wrong here, 
it's actually exhibiting something called an entity services anti-pattern. And it's got a little bit of distributed monolith going on there. So um, again, one of the things that Sam spoke about uh, yesterday was about the distributed monolith being one of the worst ways that you can land up in a system. And this can often typically happen when, uh, if you start just with the microservices architecture right from day one, but you've, you've come from a sort of a classical understanding of how systems work together, it's quite easy to just decompose them into the entities that you're very used to the way you would have done it in a monolith. So if we have a look what happened here, we can see that uh, there are the services, there's an order service, there's a user service, there's a product services, classic entities. And the problem with this is that when a, uh, a web request comes into the web API, if it wants to do something like order a product, it will, it will go to order a product on the order service, but then the order service needs to speak to the product service, which needs to speak to the user service, and a whole bunch of calls need to happen just to facilitate one particular path. And the, um, the sort of a classic symptom is that we've got a chatty, a chatty architecture. So, yeah, so a word of warning, though, is that uh, you can't just apply these uh, sort of metrics blindly. So we can't just say, oh, well, if there's, you know, uh, you know if, if there's a degree of six, that's really problematic. It does really depend on your particular circumstances. You may have an architecture with hundreds or, uh, you know, a thousand if you're Monzo type uh, sort of setup of, of services, and your metrics will be different. So it is important that you understand at least what your architecture is in order to appropriately apply these metrics. What happens when you run the community detection? So this is, uh, these two are exactly the same. So the graph on the left-hand side is, was run in a Jupyter notebook uh, with Python, uh, but it's quite hard to see what's going on. So I've superimposed the colors onto our architectural sort of diagram. And this is what the system reckons the main classifications are or the groupings are for the, uh, the microservices. So three areas, we can see that it's kind of put the big ball of mud into one area, but then it's also identified a yellow area, which actually happens to be, maybe looks like a somewhat decent bounded context. That's maybe the, um, uh, it's the uh, shipping API, and the purple one is the, uh, the payments API. Now, um, yeah, so this has already at least detected for us that the, the, big, the big ball of mud is one area. And interestingly enough, it's, it's maybe not what our architects were expecting. So they were maybe hoping that actually, yes, I was expecting that we've got an area that's nicely coupled out in order to do the payments and the shipping, but we're kind of hoping that there was a more a user management section and there was something that dealing more with, with sort of products, but the reality is actually quite different. And by running something like this, you can actually get an insight that if you're having problems with your, you know, maybe releasing fast enough because you've changed, your organization is set up to work work that way, but actually you're very tightly coupled, this is an indicator that uh, maybe, this is, maybe this is why, because there's a lot of tight coupling between the areas. So I, like, I love this slide, so I have to put it in here. Um, obviously it doesn't always work out that way. But one of the other interesting uh, effects that can sometimes happen with the community detection algorithm is that depending on how your organizations work, you may actually detect the boundaries of uh, big units of the teams and how they work. So um, uh, Conway's law, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with it, is that uh, it talks that the, 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 the sort of design of your system will often mimic the organizational structures that you have. So if you have teams that are trying to be independent and they might create anti-corruption layers and things around them, you may find that the algorithm actually kind of highlights that. So you can potentially have a, you can potentially use this to see maybe how, maybe what the, either the bounded contexts are or they may be based on uh, organizational factors. So one of my colleagues wrote a blog a while ago, uh, which is called Heuristics for Identifying Service Boundaries, 
And it goes into detail about the fact that it's not always the obvious domain-driven design uh, boundaries that people uh, will, will partition their system up against. Sometimes it is in the sort of process case, but maybe you've got data locality requirements, maybe you've got technical or operational concerns, and these may land up as the reasons for, for why you land up with the boundaries that you do. So you can say, okay, well, you know, that's great. So we managed to, to at least highlight that there was a, a potentially a problem in, in a system that we have. But what happens if we change our system? What happens if we try and make an improvement? If we were to run those metrics again, would we be able to see any kind of difference? Would it show us that we've, we've improved or not? So now we're going to have a look at version two of the architecture. And we identified that one of the problem areas was the fact that we have this uh, entity service anti-pattern. So as a first step, what we want to do is say, we really did want a team that was going to be able to be autonomous and work around uh, a user management domain. So let's try and pull that functionality out and deal with it separately. So what we do is we take our, um, our uh, user entity service and we break it up into a number of different more functional uh, sort of areas. So this may be things like update the user's management preferences or disable the user or, or whatever type thing, but something that is more sort of discrete rather than having one entity that absolutely everybody has to hit. Likewise, we also don't want any of the, the user functionality to go to the more legacy front-end services. We want them to go to a new front-end service, so we pull that out and we have them speak to our, our more sort of uh, functional sort of uh, microservices that we created. And then we need to do other bits and bobs as well to ensure that both sides can speak to each other. So in this case, we're going to have uh, our user management uh, sort of system is going to manage its own data, but the legacy distributed monolith still needs to work. So we'll have a asynchronous process that will send the events across to the monolith and allow it to continue. In order to make that happen though, we've also had to put what we call a um, a sort of monolithic user service into the, uh, the, the big ball of mud to look like some of the calls uh, onto the other side uh, so that th that side can carry on uh, independently. So we've got uh, some asynchronous processes that are taking the data, making it available to the other side so it can carry on, but we want to try and see can we at least manage our user management side separately. So if we take away the queues and all the other bits and bobs, we're left with just the microservices and the actual uh, calls that they make between uh, each other. We run our network stats. Uh, we get some new stats. And we say, all right, let's plot that onto, uh, onto some, some graphs. And let's see what we get now. So once again, we have a look and we say, OK, Let's have a look at what the degree uh, highlights. So it's highlighted again most of the uh, sort of backend services in our distributed monolith. But interestingly, it's actually highlighted the two new web services. And you think, well, is this good or bad? Am I I'm expecting this? Now, if you think about this, just from purely the one, the one metric, it actually does make sense. So the front-end web services are, at least for the user, they have now got uh, sort of separate uh, functional services that they need to call. So it makes sense that they're going to have to make six or so calls in order to do that. So that in itself is not necessarily problematic. You might say, you might think, well, maybe it is, maybe I should be splitting that up, and that could be the case. But what we're really interested in, in is the really chattiness of the architecture. So we're going to pause that and see, let's see where the cluster coefficient goes. So the cluster coefficient, when we run it on this architecture, again, it highlights most of the areas in the distributed monolith. But crucially, it hasn't actually highlighted anything on, the, um, on, our, new, on our new services. So when we combine the degree of the individual nodes and the cluster coefficients, the problematic areas are, it's still highlighted as being in the big ball of mud, but actually it looks like the, the extracted user service related functionality is roughly able to, to sort of operate independently. 
When we run the community detection uh, algorithm, we get a slightly different picture. So now we've got five areas that it's highlighted. Uh, we've still got our big ball of mud. Um, but interestingly, it happens to have pulled in the, um, the, the payment APIs, the adapter and, and the payment APIs. You might think, well, you know, why, why has that happened? And these algorithms are not perfect, so this can happen, and this is also why you sometimes need to use uh, intuition and an understanding of your architecture to decide whether it's problematic or not. But you can look at this and say, yeah, I can probably understand maybe why it thinks it belongs uh, in the red area, but as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's good enough. It's going through one adapter and, and then going out to the different services. I'm okay. Or maybe you want to separate it out. It's completely up to you. Still got our payment service in the blue there, but interestingly now we've got in the orange section, we've got look what looks like a more standalone bounded context for managing our users. And that is actually what we're after to try and make things a little bit easier for a team to be able to self-manage, self-release, and, and progress down the path. Now you might say, well, what about those two, what about those two at the bottom? Uh, they're just floating around doing nothing. Um, as I said to you before, uh, we needed to have an asynchronous process that was going to make the events from the uh, everything that's going on, the user service, available uh, again to the distributed monolith. So those two are really just listeners listening to the, the database events and then making it available on the other side. But because our network is only currently interested in the HTTP calls, they don't have any direct links, so they are little orphans uh, in this particular case. So if we compare version 1 and version 2, what do we find? So get something that looks like this. So we've got um, the version 1 is in green and version 2 is in yellow. The degrees are the bars, and the classic coefficients are the little dots. So we had our user service, which was over here. Um, and what we did was we took our V1 user service and we split it out into a few more um, uh, V2 user services, the more functional ones. We needed to put our monolithic user service back in to allow the distributed monolith to continue. But this is essentially where we've landed up. Now, if you have a look at the degrees, the, the lines, you can see, well, actually, they're mostly the same. Not much has really changed. What has changed uh, is maybe for the legacy web application services, so the mobile API, the web API, the B2B API, they previously had a degree of five, and it's come down to four. So that seems like a good thing, like the numbers have come down, so, so hopefully that's good. And if we think about it, we had our uh, legacy mobile APIs, and we split out the user service uh, into its own area. So actually, there's one less call when it comes to managing users that needs to take place, so we could understand why the degree went down for those services from five to four. So we think, okay, that's, that's, that's good. But what happens when we have a look at the cluster coefficient? Now it looks a little bit different, and we think, oh dear, it actually seems to have gone up. Now, isn't that problematic? Because Intuition says it should be going down. Um, what's going on here? Now, again, if you, if, you, if you look at the architecture and you look at what the cluster coefficient means, you can actually make sense of this. So again, this is on the legacy front-end services, so the mobile and the web API. And if you recall, we had, we had quite a tight-knit group of services, and we pulled the user, server, the user functionality out. And essentially what happened is that the, the big ball of mud just got tighter. So the user functionality came out, and everything else just still spoke with each other. So in that case, the cluster coefficient for the legacy side of the system actually got, got, got tighter. But interestingly enough, all of the services on the, the left-hand side here have a cluster coefficient of, of zero. So that has gone down relative to the user, the individual user service that used to exist there previously. So there are other options uh, that you can do to analyze different aspects of your microservice architecture as well. So just to give you a flavor of some of the things, you can uh, do something like uh, strongly connected components. 
So this can potentially, in this scenario, help you to maybe detect things like circular dependencies. You may want to have a look at some of the pathfinding algorithms. So this could potentially help you to have a look at are you calling deprecated services or something like that? So you might think that you've deprecated something, but when you actually have a look at, at the paths, you might find, well, actually, there is, a way to, there is a way to get to that service. And uh, this is very helpful when you're using like the distributed tracing. Uh, it, it gives you some of this information, but being able to extract that information into a graph database, graph database or something that you can analyze yourself is quite important. So, in conclusion, uh, what I would like to say is that this is very much early days. So, um, we're still experimenting with some of this stuff. And I'd be very interested, actually, to know if anybody else is, is looking at this or looking at th these type of things. I'd love to chat with you about that. But crucially, these metrics and what I've shown you, they can't just be applied blindly to any microservice architecture. You can't say that I went to a talk and uh, the, the lady on the stage, she said, if you've got a degree of six or more, that you've got a distributed monolith. You can't, you can't do that. It is very context dependent. It depends how many services you have. It depends on, on what you're doing. And that definitely does need to be taken into account. So this could be a little bit like if you have uh, sort of unit testing software and you say, well, if it's 75% or less, then you're doomed. Uh, same thing applies here. It's not, a, it's not a common metric you can just use. So it doesn't mean that our architects are being you know, uh, shelved. Uh, I know that's sometimes a, a dirty word for some people. Uh, but architects still have a very important uh, part to play in understanding what's going on and being able to ensure that we do things sensibly. So, um, if we had a look at what our sort of general hypothesis was that we started with, we said it would hopefully it would be really nice if we could try and start moving towards doing data-driven architectural improvement. And hopefully, I've managed to show you that you can actually extract metrics and KPIs from your microservice architecture. We already have some of the tooling there, especially in the ops space, to be able to help us to get some of these metrics out. And if you can then put that into some kind of graph database or something where you can analyze that and use graph theory, you can then use that to gain insight into the architecture itself and hopefully use that to understand the characteristics of your architecture and hopefully make some improvements. Specifically, we had a look at uh, an example, a microservice architect, and you said, given we, we kind of knew there was something wrong with it, could we actually use these metrics to detect something like a tightly coupled architecture? And uh, hopefully that's been uh, demonstrated as well. And the metrics and the algorithms that we used were three. So the first, one, the first two were the degree and the cluster coefficient. And these were used to detect the tightly coupled aspects of, of the architecture. They weren't, they're not something necessarily that you can just use in isolation. So you can't just use the degree or the cluster coefficient is probably the one that's a little bit more um, meaty in this case. But it's generally the combination of the two that allows you to, to detect that. Likewise, we also ran community detection algorithms. It was Levain modularity for those who are interested. Uh, over, over this uh, particular set of microservices, and that uncovered different uh, groupings or boundaries uh, that might exist or that the system thinks exists within the system. So this may or may not align with what you were hoping were your domain-driven uh, sort of boundaries. It may actually represent uh, something more like your organization, Conway's law, or even other entities. So again, you've got to have a sort of objective look at that and see what actually comes out of that. If you are at all interested in learning more about this, I would actually highly recommend this book from Mark Needham and Amy Hodler. Uh, they're from Neo4j. They've got, uh, they go into this in more detail, but it's also done in quite a practical way that you can digest and get your head around. So if you're interested in this, um, this is a really a, a great book, I think, to have a look at. And with that, I am probably done.
So I think I've probably run out of time for questions, but uh, I'm more than, help, more than happy to take any questions afterwards. And please do remember to rate the session. It would be really good uh, to get your feedback. Thank you very much.